I'd like to introduce you um, um, to, to Mark Ward, and, and we're here to, to, to learn and listen about uh, Food HQ. So, so I read through this morning um, a, a bit of a resume online about Mark, and it was, um, it was quite in depth and very, very impressive. But, um, but Food HQ, a collaboration of uh, Massey University and the Riddip Institute and uh, Manawatu and, and uh, Palmerston North Councils and, and Ag Research, and, and I think there's a lot of good, good work going on, so I look forward to, to listening to that. Um, Mark said he doesn't mind a, a little bit of uh, question and interaction during, um, during, during his presentation. Um, so that's fine, feel free, and, and hopefully there'll be room for a few questions at the end. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real privilege to be here. Thank you to Beef and Lamb. Uh, thank you to Mel Poulton, who um, suggested it, that, that I do get a chance to talk about Food HQ, but probably more importantly, talk about what you've actually just heard about, but in, in the terms of what are some of the solutions. So thank you for staying in this room. It's very encouraging to have an audience, and I would like to interact with you and take your questions, especially if you think something's not quite uh, to your taste. But um, so what I thought I'd go through today is just give you a little bit around the situation, both domestically and globally, and I promise I'm not getting into demographics like every other speaker does. Um, we've all heard the demographics, but I will touch a little bit on consumer trends and profiles that could be of interest to you. So just as Craig spoke about the fibre industry, uh, from a consumer expect, uh, perspective. This talk will specifically be about food and about beverage, but read into that the whole value chain. In other words, if you're a producer of food, uh, you're in there as well. Then I want to go into some insights that I think are relevant to all of us, uh, to New Zealand in particular. I will take a very national perspective on, uh, on our thinking here, um, and then some questions that we are asking ourselves as a big consortium of food innovators uh, that form Food HQ. There's actually 11 partners in Food HQ. Those councils, Massey, Reddit, and then Ag Research, who are in the room, Plant and Food Research, Cawthron Institute, which is a private institute at the top of the South Island, ESR, which is a forensics institute, Assure Quality, Fonterra. So they're all part of um, Food HQ. And now we have about 40 company members, and we're on a sort of a recruitment of membership, if you like, to bring you as close as possible to the coal base about what I'm going to talk about. So th the answer to the questions I pose, we see through the innovation lens, but I want to distinguish between, and one of the previous speakers, whether it was Dan or Craig, distinguish between invention um, and innovation. Invention is actually one of the things that uh, we as Kiwis are very, very good at. And that goes back to the comments around number eight wire and being very adaptable to change, look how we adapted to the, uh, the, the closing of the European Union, or, or at the time it was, it was Great Britain. So um, we are adaptable, we are inventive. That is not enough in terms of um, convincing consumers to give farmers, growers, fishers uh, a necessary uh, piece of the value. And then collaboration, which I'm delighted uh, people have talked about already. So collaboration, we believe, is, is the key to going forward, and probably pan sector. Uh, not just focused on red meat and fibre, but also on what's happening in horticulture. You would have seen the, the recent release of how that multiple industry sector is growing quite well, quite rapidly. Uh, seafood is also going quite well, and as you know, wine is going well. So New Zealand is a food paradise, and we've got 150 years behind us of export success, and actually success in invention and in science, you know, it's the strength of our science, the strength of our farmers, um, the strength of our education systems and our leadership, I guess, as a nation that's got us to where we are so far. But I would hazard, from what Craig has said and what Dan has said earlier, that we are already past the tipping point of where our business model as a nation has, in fact, changed. And, of course, nothing can happen in a hurry. Uh, we've got a lot of stakeholders. Uh, we have directors of large companies that have to get their heads around, so what does this mean for our cooperatives? Um, the big companies in New Zealand that are not foreign owned are the ones that can't be. Um, so that's, that's interesting in itself. So the likes of tallies, etc., are not yet uh, foreign owned. So we've got to get our heads around our big companies. We've got to get our heads around our new companies busting through into the consumer market, and then our heads around the middle band, which are the Zespri's and the Merino uh, New Zealand company. So we've got to get our heads around that. Now this, I did this on purpose, 
The world wants more of what New Zealand has to offer. Uh, for example, good Canterbury lamb. Now Canterbury lamb, that brand is, any guess how old that brand is? 60 years. 120. How old is Anchor as a brand in the market, a global market? 130 years old. So, um, but even though we've got great, we have actually got some great brands at this stage and we have to go a lot further. That's not actually what um, the growing consumer class are necessarily going to bite into, a beautiful piece of land. They don't even have an oven, for example, in, in, in some of the markets that we're pushing into. Even, the, even in Germany and Denmark, uh, things are changing with single, single um, occupation dwellings and, and how they decide to cook their food. But we, as I say, we've got a proud history. We're a nation of big hearts, and that's, in a sense, more a statement about we get excited about what we believe in. We show leadership almost you know, this room is definitely full of leaders. The fact that you're here is because you're interested in being an influencer. Uh, but there is, a, there is a point that we get to that we um, actually fall a little foul of things. Because even though we know our domestic market is so small, um, only barely five million plus a million or something tourists, um, and I'll come back to the tourist point in a minute, um, we know that our destiny actually has to lie offshore. And so we've built these industries over the last 150 years. In fact, if we don't get the next model right, and many companies are starting to show us the way, and I'll touch on some of those companies, if we don't get that model right, we will be the Xerox um, of agri-food, unfortunately. Why? Uh, we will be toast as a nation. And the, the simple reason is actually 25% of our GDP um, comes out of food and fibre, uh, if not more. How does that calculate? 6% is you guys, producers, farmers, and if you're a processor in the room, that's another 6% of our GDP. If you are a trucker or a communications expert or a related industry, IT, whatever, services to the agri-food sector, you're a 7%, 7 7% 7 of New Zealand's GDP, so where have we got to? 19% so far. And the remaining 6% of our GDP is when you go out and spend money on the rest of the economy. So 25% of the nation's GDP is bound up in our sector. We can't afford to get the model wrong, is, is our point, okay? Otherwise, we are talking Xerox here. So companies are leading the way. I've just randomly chosen Mount Cook Salmon because of their statement about how they supply top restaurants around the world. And it was very interesting to see Dan's data around casual dining. Um, and I think he had two or three categories there. And I've got some Euro Monitor uh, global trends for 216 around the different categories of dining where global consumers are heading. But this uh, tiny company in the South Island has worked out its value proposition and including the domestic market. Don't overlook the value of the domestic market. So their product ends up at a restaurant I would one day like to go and dine at. Um, I've not even been to New York, been everywhere else, but not to New York. Um, and that one there too, is a, there's an entire book written about the quality standards and the ethos of that restaurant in New York and how it sources only the best produce. That is where our, some of our emerging New Zealand companies are starting to focus. Now this is fine dining, obviously. That's not the only market segment uh, New Zealand companies are focusing on, or should be focusing on, because we've got to spread our risk, as we'll see from some of the data in a moment. But New Zealand is becoming a sophisticated market. And about, about three years ago, I developed a strong interest in wine, um, uh, from the point of view that they're really good at marketing and positioning their product on the shelf. One uh, wine company in particular it only took them seven years to win the Supreme Award in the UK for their wine um, from way to go. And that's pretty amazing when you think. UK, world's most sophisticated uh, wine market and a New Zealand company is able to win the Supreme Award. Renew World, we're, we're very different. We've got something about us. So we've got a, that's interested me. And I, so I've been working in Marlborough. Uh, I live and work in, in Massey here at Palmerston, but I, Every week I go to Marlborough and work two days in the Marlborough region, working with companies just to really understand um, how, they're, how they're getting uh, 
the success out of aquaculture and wine. And of course, drinking a little bit of Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. So we are creative with food. Not a lot of red meat on that plate there, but we are creative with food. We are innovative. We need to look at that. So New Zealand food and beverage companies are stomping along like raging bulls. They really are. We're talking about 20% uh, average growth here per annum for these small emerging companies. And why? It's because of the rewarding experience they are offering ultimately consumers if they get as far as the consumer. Um, and I chucked up the anchor brand there just to remind us that's 130 years old. So um, we can get a brand that survives uh, the test of time. And I trust Merino will be one of those brands as will Icebreaker, etc. What about the global agenda? So we're sort of into the situation still, um, globally. And Mel, thanks for all your inspiration around this. Mel and I caught up at Central District's Field Days this year, and she, um, she pinned me to my corona and told me about what, which, which tent were we in? Were we in the um, beef and lamb tent? Oh, Reagan's down, okay. Um, she, she talked to me, because she's a Nuffield, she talked to me about what's going on in the world and how these three organisations, which are set up basically to make sure World War III doesn't happen, um, could have inflexible frameworks when it comes to the emerging markets that we're focusing on. Now, we all know that by 2030, the G7, which is the seven most powerful economies in the world, will be supplanted, uh, overtaken by the E7, which is the emerging seven economies in the world. And I can't always remember them, but I'll give it a go. So it's China, obviously, India, Brazil, Russia, Turkey, and Indonesia. Now, a few of those are driven sh by sheer population alone. Uh, note also the number of Muslim countries in that. Uh, here's an interesting statement someone made yesterday. Bless you. Um, it was around, New Zealand has, has become quite a secular nation when we're talking about religion. Oh, I know, it was a um, teacher in the school that my kids go to. New Zealand's become a secular nation when it comes to religion, but we don't realise that 80% of the world are very religious outside New Zealand. Not always Catholicism or Christianity or the religions we might be more familiar with, but um, very different religions. So we're selling to people with very strong beliefs along a certain uh, code of practice. So I'm not sure why I brought that up, but the, the, the point is that we have to think globally. And so Mel told me a country without food security is a country at war. And in a sense, that is correct. And in fact, ISIS um, got the advantage because of the famine in Syria. So they catapulted to strength based on a lack of nutrition. And the other really important thing that Mel and I discussed was that it's not that we can't produce enough food for the planet, uh, we can, it's infrastructure is the problem. Not just physical infrastructure, we know there's a lot of wastage, especially in horticulture, there's vast amounts wasted. India could feed Europe on, on the waste horticulture uh, that, that spoils in India, they could feed Europe. So it's physical infrastructure, but it's political infrastructure, and I wanna get to the last one as the most important, but it's financial infrastructure, yes, of course, um, but institutional infrastructure. So coming back to the C word, collaboration, how do we get our institutions to collaborate across borders, across frontiers, or even within New Zealand for that matter, um, when there is common good, global good uh, to be gained? I think this is a very big picture topic, but like at Massey University where I'm based, I'm trying to get, and they are doing it, the universities talking to each other, we're taking a world tour of a couple of top uh, universities, Wageningen, UR, um, uh, we're going to Stanford, etc., uh, with, with some of our uh, Food HQ members, Gold members, and it is to try and cause that ferment between institutions and, and collaborate. So knowledge and collaboration is one of the key areas. And as we, as growers, start to come up against social license, the, the right to farm, uh, when you look at waterways, or erosion, or greenhouse gases, or you name it, whatever else, animal welfare, um, when, when we all come up against those sorts of issues, uh, collaboration is one of the ways to really get, get through the quagmire. So we, we also know parts of the planet 
uh, won't have or don't have already, uh, you look at Australia, don't have enough fresh water uh, to do the sort of agriculture they want to do and in some cases not enough sustainable energy. However, um, there is a, a slide a little further on where I point out, and Mel and I did the calculation on this, there are 130 New Zealands um, in Brazil of further production land they can use with sustainable fresh water supply. So they can grow protein, uh, grass and, and animal protein uh, with, with another 130 New Zealands. So we've sort of got to think, it's, it isn't a production issue at all. Uh, it's an infrastructure issue, it's a knowledge issue, it's a marketing issue, it's how are we going to reach the right consumers. And then there's this depressing slide about climate change and the PWC report saying that it could affect fishing yields down to about 40% drop um, in countries that most need it. So what does that mean for our seafood industry? In fact, if all of our frozen fish uh, that we export went off as chilled, obviously on an airplane instead of a boat, um, we've modelled it at MPI that it'll, be, it'll double the value of our seafood industry overnight. Um, and it is possible because there are a lot of seafood companies that are, all their fish is air flown to specific consumers, to banquets in China. Pick up the phone, we want 3,000 snapper, we want them to be three kilograms each, and that's when he sends the fishing boats out to get the snapper, and then it's air flown up into China for a banquet. So those sorts of models are fascinating for all of us to understand. I won't dwell on the slide, we are so familiar with this that there's been a tipping point Supply chains are no longer chains. Supply chains are webs. They are very complex. And in the midst of all of that, red meat's a bit different, but um, with processed foods, combinatorial foods, with many ingredients coming from various places, coconut milk coming from here and whatever, um, it's a big issue around traceability, food safety. Who's, who's liable? Who's responsible? I'll get on to the Chinese typical Chinese consumer in a moment, but as far as they're concerned, if something goes wrong with a food, uh, guess what guys, it's not the um, manufacturer they go after, even if there was ad adulteration, it's not the government they go after, they'd be in trouble if they did. Um, in China they go after where it came from, the source, the farmer themselves. So that it's a bit of a two-edged sword, um, promoting your farms, your family even, online, um, in a Chinese consumer's mind, that's great. That's probably why they'll be interested in your product. Uh, but if things go sour, the reverse is true. They think the farmer got it wrong. We don't know why that is, we need to find out. But that's how it is in China. And I'm sure if that wasn't the case, it wasn't the farmer who got it wrong. So, um, and you've heard, we saw um, Craig's slide, 380 million diabetics around the world. So that's interesting. Um, so that consumer access to information, social media, that is always going to be a two-edged sword. E-commerce, for example, it's fantastic in terms of reaching the consumer. You'll see a little bit further on in my presentation, Chinese consumers actually shop for the ingredients on the way to work in the morning on their phone, and it's delivered in a cardboard box to their apartment, which doesn't have an oven, possibly a microwave, and 50% of their um, dining is outside the home. So um, these are things that make us all think about our business model. Here's Singapore, I grew up in Singapore. Um, I know all of this to be true. 99% of the food there is imported. They are worried about that now because of the complexity of the supply chain and um, counterfeiting and also just the sustainability of their economy should things go wrong in the shipping lanes or a major volcanic eruption or whatever. So now they're talking about where have we got real estate that we can grow fresh produce that keeps our nation healthy. And they still have in their memories the Jap Japanese occupation years, because uh, like Singapore was just a fish fishing village. And it was discovered by Stanford Raffles um, of England. And as I say, during the Second World War, they suffered a lot. Um, th those memories are still with them. So guess what? The only real estate left in Singapore is on the roof is on the roof. So they've got skyscrapers, they've got huge apartment blocks where people live, thousands of people live in one building. The only spare real estate they've got left is the roof. So now all planning consents 
around new buildings take into account horticulture being grown on the roof. It's called vertical horticulture if you Google it. Don't know if you can grow animals on the roof, but yeah, at this stage they're thinking horticulture. So some of the consumer trends. So here's a question, how well do we understand consumer preferences? I mentioned the UK as the world's most sophisticated food and beverage market and probably leading the trend. What was that acronym you used, Craig? Lohars? Lifestyles of health and sustainability. Thank you. Very nice. Um, so you would think the UK was leading all that trend, but if you look through, we've com uh, Euromonitor have compared India and China with UK. Just worry about the purple and the brown, because the rest of it sort of not, doesn't matter much. But look at how China and India do get all of these things. Country of origin, very important. Re recyclable, extremely important in India because there's no landfill left, and that is the case in China too. They have to chuck everything into their local river. Um, and uh, certified animal welfare, in particular in India, because of their um, religious beliefs, for example, etc. So you're a monitor, you'll find this online. So how, these are some of the questions, how quickly can we respond? Asian consumers have leapfrogged the European consumer, and I know it's so important to focus on Europe and America. <coughs> they are huge opportunities, especially as trading regulations change and give us more access. However, um, it's interesting that the most sophisticated consumers now appear to be in Asia. They've leapfrogged everybody. That in Taiwan, for example, take the w women demographic. Women are generally deciding not to get married before 30 if they can help it. They like the fact that they're independent, they're on a good salary, uh, they don't have to put up with what the guy wants all the time um, in those environments. So, and China's heading the same way. The big tipping point in China was dual income. So as soon as uh, both partners, <coughs> both spouses are working um, that, that tipped everything. And when you think about the future Chinese consumer, at the moment, she or he is um, probably about 12 years old on average. They are going to be our, our future consumer in about five years' time. Um, they have had investment from six adults entirely into that one life, that one consumer. Why? Because of the single child policy um, created the one child from two parents and four grandparents, all focused on the one child because remember one of them was a girl only family. So, you know, any geneticists in the room? So we've got um, a really interesting, super wealthy Chinese consumer, not too far away. But hyper uh, competition, e-commerce, New Zealand Manuka honey, have you ever uh, Googled it on Alibaba to see 50 brands? Um, how do you position yourself if you're all Manuka honey? I know NPR working out things like the, um, the standards and all that, and that will come through shortly. But do we just take price? Do we just take price? Is that what we do? Or uh, do we think differently like Marino's doing and others? So we understand this, understand the consumer. Craig, hit that home. So this is an interesting piece from, again, Euromonitor 216. The size of the organics market, you would have seen uh, Fonterra's, or the news about Fonterra paying $9 for organic milk, uh, per kilogram of milk solids, uh, whatever that means. Uh, whatever is behind that at the moment, I don't know. But look at that, so globally, 32 billion US for um, food and four billion US for beverage with an organic label. But what's far more important than that, and New Zealand can play to these strengths, is the top bar, which is over 50% of consumers believed, and I'm sorry you can't see this, over 50% of consumers believed natural, just natural is the most important thing. And then underneath natural comes all the reasons that they think about natural. So no GMOs, no you know genetically modified organism has touched this. Etc. Etc. Um, no additives, no preservatives. Again, beautiful positioning if New Zealand can continue to get this right uh, for global consumers. 
And I said the Asian consumer is so sophisticated now, they don't, food, food has meaning. It's always had meaning in Asia for whatever reason. As I said, I grew up in Asia. Food has a very deep significance. It is the most important thing that families and friends, if you are in their inner circle, the way they show you you are in their inner circle is they, they always have a meal. That is mandatory and usually not at their home. They'll take you out to the flashiest restaurant they can afford. So food means so much. And now for the millennial, although in their case it won't yet be the millennials, but it'll be you know the, whatever the pre-millennials are, uh, it's, it, food has meaning and it dis displays wealth and it displays discernment and it displays quality and it tells, tells you about the person. So food is very, very special to Asians. It's been special to them way before it was really special to us and it'll be tied up in their history as to why that's the case. So just to finish off now, am I okay for time? Thank you, sir. So just to finish, start heading towards the goalposts. Um, we know we're a wonderful place to produce healthy livestock. Keep in mind South America. So what does that mean? Where do we position ourselves? I got very encouraged. I was a bit late, but I heard most of Dan's presentation online, very encouraged by the burger batch and what that could mean. I think a gentleman in the room asked a very tough question of Dan. He didn't answer it. Um, he, he gave us an answer, but it didn't answer the question, which was how is the New Zealand farmer going to benefit from the likes of that model as much as possible? Oh, look, it's, it's a great thing, fantastic. It's the great first stage, and Dan is the man. He's worked it all out. He's got his model worked out, and guess what he said was number one? People. So did Craig. When Craig said, we make sure we have the best marketing team money can buy, and we make sure we have an environmental scientist. So we know the deep side of our business. And this is sort of my way of introducing Food HQ as well, but, uh, and what we're about. But that's really, really important, people. We have understood as a nation that for the last 150 years, that you cannot separate the development of our land and our fisheries from the development of people. I think we understand that, that it's inextricable. We have to do that at the same time because it's the people that farm the land. Uh, it's the people that begin to develop relationships overseas and understand value chains. So keep, you know, beef and lamb and everyone in the room, keep investing in yourselves, first and foremost, because you're here because you're a leader, you've got to invest in yourselves, come on the world tour at Food, Food HQ, um, and invest in the next generation. We're trying to influence high schools. I, the first time I stood up in front of the elite at um, Wanganui Collegiate, like the top 50 students academically. It took me 15 minutes talking this way for them to get beyond, what is he doing here? What is flipping burgers got to do with me wanting to be a dentist or a lawyer? That's the positioning of food in our new generation coming through. Really smart kids. You know, they'll be CEOs of Rabobank one day. But um, the important thing is they need to be, they, and they're farmers, many of them farmers' children. So, they need to understand that it's not about, um, I won't say what Richard Redmayne, said, Redmayne says, he's quite brutal when he talks about it. it's not about pulling this and cutting that off. It's about um, the value chain. So we get all of this, Marlborough's amazing, it's the only place I've been to so far and studied vineyards and, and how they do things. It's just incredible, the technology that goes into this, the seafood, the more untouched, the better. The lobster example, keep the thing alive. It's got to be looking at you in the restaurant in Shanghai uh, to command $150 a kilogram. But our competitors are innovating at speed. Um, we've got to be careful that we don't think just because we've had a great idea, just because we've got an invention, that we're going to stay safe. Um, and I think, Craig, you even touched on that when you went, talked about IDEO. And what was it? Ideate, create, validate. So um, we're not doing the, I don't think we're doing the create as much as we can and we're needing to do the validate a whole lot more. So science and innovation continue to be the critical to our sector's success. And I know that's one of the reasons you're here today. You've got a lot of scientists on the program. That's fantastic. You've got AgriSearch here. You've got Massey here. You've probably got Lincoln as well. So. 
These are the institutions, and before it was AgriSearch, it was the DSIR and MAFTEC, okay? But these are our most important institutions, MPI uh, and its predecessors, <coughs> AgriSearch and its predecessors, and all the other CRIs. These are the reasons um, we can still command our position in the world because we don't just, um, how did Dan put it, or was it you, Craig? We don't just, uh, it was you, you were talking about the design school. We don't just um, do things that don't happen naturally and get on with it. When we have science, we understand why it's happening. And why do we understand why it's happening? So that we can create sustainable competitive advantage. Maybe we can protect some of the IP, or we can keep it black box, or we can wrap a brand around it, but we understand what our key competitive advantage is. So Food HQ, just to finish off, introduces, is the largest food innovation consortium in New Zealand's history. Um, the staffing alone of the partners in R&D would be number in the thousands. Just here in this town, uh, in this city, it's uh, over 2,000 staff focused on agri-food research, academics, uh, teaching students, PhD students. So it's a great critical piece of critical mass, and believe you me, other countries in the world have this as well. But I think we have something different, and we're going on this world tour to also understand how they have been so successful. Why is the Netherlands only the size of the Waikato? And it is we want to understand why the Dutch have got it right, uh, the Danes, etc. So business model is the first thing. We <coughs> do get deliriously preoccupied with what goes in the shipping container. Actually, it's, that's, that's not where you can invent your margin. It's in your business model. And D-School does that as well up at Stanford. But I'm saying it's a lot cheaper for me just to <coughs> talk to my colleague at Nassi. Uh, and th that's the way we understand holistically what's going on. So people like um, Professor Hamish Gow, Professor Nicholas Shadbolt, all those types of people at Massey, their equivalents at Lincoln, or any other university in New Zealand, try to understand um, value. And that, that's where we would start. Hopefully, what might fall out of that for some of our food HQ partners is you actually need maybe a little bit of science done in packaging. When we work with the horticulture sector, their number one question whenever they pick up the phone to me at Food HQ is, uh, and I, I wait for it and I go, yep, there we go again. With horticulture, it's always, uh, I've got some garlic and it's going off in the consumer pack. Why? And of course, well, even I can tell them that because I'm, I am trained as a scientist but never practiced. But um, yeah, it's breathing, it's still alive. So it respires, it perspires, and then you have fun mold. So that requires science. The packaging science is really, really important. Uh, you may not require science, and that's fine as well. We'll start just with your business model. Cool. Any others? Tom? Uh, yes, uh, Professor Hamish Gow, um, uh, food safety is, 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 is major, and, and we've got a good story to tell. Um, why, have we, why are we seeing the demise of refrigerated or frozen products? I mean, I would have thought, I mean, sure, there's logistics the other end, but there's still an awful lot of market that can handle um, something that's frozen. I, I too, you know how, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite fashionable to say, let's get out of frozen and to fresh, right? Mm -hmm. And that's great. There's, I'll tell you a story about where that is really, really happening. But one of the reasons we're going on this trip at the end of the month also is to go to Western Flanders, where there is the world's most innovative frozen horticulture centre. I can't even get my head around frozen particularly. I know frozen peas and all that. Yeah, I get that. Um, but we're talking about the, the appearance of freshness can be maintained through freezing. So it's been fashionable to say, let's get out of frozen but it is what made us great in the first place, being able to 13 months, uh, 13 weeks, etc., of fresh, and then if you freeze it, it'll last much longer. So let's find out. I think that's a very important question, and we're gonna find out whether frozen is still, has still got legs on it. Well, my feeling is um, to, to go popular, to go modern, we've actually cut our avenues that which we did so well. Yes. So onto the story in Queensland, where 
a wealthy family, the Wagners, invested 200 million in extending the runway of a rural Queensland town so that it could take China Airlines flights, freight flights. It, just Google it. Um, so the Wagner family and the council invested 200 million in extending their, and strengthening the airport to take uh, wide body freight aircraft. And now they're flying milk, I, I now mean milk, milk and lettuces and salads and all that up to China, um, fresh. So the market will always drive what your decision making um, finally is. So if the market is in frozen, then that's where you should go. If that's what the consumer is saying, I want it frozen until the uh, till 15 minutes before I want to eat it, then that is your opportunity. Hi, my name is Natalie Bowie. I'm doing a Kellogg Rural Leadership um, Program at the moment, and I'm doing it exactly on farmers and niche marketing and where they can find, I guess, um, be able to add value. Um, just wondering what you guys are doing in terms of sort of the, the design thinking into it, because I'm, I'm not hearing a lot of that from. Okay, so um, people may know that design thinking is to start very much from how would the user of your product um, view your product if you got it right, if you got the design right, and it's not just the actual physical product, but the service around it, um, the whole value proposition, if you like. So design is now becoming much more mainstream into how, how we are working with companies. Uh, NZ Trade and Enterprise support Better by Design up in Auckland, which is another organisation focused on this. Um, at Massey University, we've got a school of industrial design and we have intentionally taken, because the, the students who go to a school of industrial design generally want to design Lamborghinis or dresses or whatever. <coughs> um, they don't think about food. It's back to this hamburger flipping thing. You know, when, when most people don't get it, that the food value chain is just so full of careers. So what we're doing now is we're getting those students to pitch their design thinking into honey products, into um, meat. So for example, uh, someone last year designed a, a packaging one that you can eat, although I'm not really sure the hygiene side is great, but um, packaging you can eat after having your T-bone steak carefully positioned in it. And um, the packaging snaps so you don't have to have all five steaks. I face this with a family of five. How do I get five steaks? Um, it, it can come in like that, and you just snap off your T-bone every third night when you feel like your steak. This is somewhere in China. Uh, you just stick it in the freezer, and you just snap it off. The packaging allows you to get your individual piece of steak. That's the way forward. Design. And this is like 22-year-old. Another 20-year-old designed a product combining manuka honey and vodka, and uh, I was on the taste panel. And, um, but the most beautiful thing about it, I discovered later, was that um, it was encased in beeswax. And he had designed a metal strip that you pull this way and it um, takes the top off the beeswax and then bottoms up with your vodka and honey and put it in a beautiful case with lots of black and red on it that they like during gift season, that's designed. Oh, there's no question, mate. Um, you walk down, down here. Mark, the foreign, foreign ownership in New Zealand meat industry is becoming very topical. I'm yes. just interested to know your view on that, and should we be concerned about it? Um, well, just the stories I've heard this morning from our two previous speakers are enough to convince me that you must get the business model right for New Zealand, and if you don't, we are Xerox. So um, that's a new word for toast, isn't it now? Um, if we don't get the business model right for New Zealand, and I think we've only got five years to do it, because as I said, someone told me, and I thought about it for a while, and I think they're probably correct, the only big New Zealand food companies that aren't foreign-owned are the ones you can't. Um, they're either owned by the farmer or they're owned by Mr. Talley. So, um, yeah, it, I think it's a worry. From the point of view of the business model, not from a xenophobic, nationalistic, we are now a global village, we have to start thinking that way. And maybe one day we won't be growing all our own meat and all our own, we, other people will be growing our meat under our 
brand and it won't just be New Zealand meat. Tricky question. Uh, how do you see the role of, uh, I guess, government regulation and, and driving some of these improvements? Driving improvements. Um, growth. Yeah, growth. I'll come back to MPI. I was seconded there for a year and a half um, for Massey. Absolutely loved being within the government um, environment where you have access to endless data, all the trends. I was on the strategy team trying to work out how we double the value of exports. You might have heard that by 2025, doubling the value. Uh, we focused on the seafood industry during my time and a little bit on horticulture. Um, it's very clear that food safety should not be seen as compliance, that it should be seen as an, an advantage, and that all of us should work together to make sure nobody stuffs up and that we get food safety right, and that because that's a brand in China and other uh, major markets where safety is number one, then that sort of regulatory framework is really, really good. But um, at the same time, we have central government, which is trying to help the economy grow, and MPI itself does have grow and protect, what they are doing is we've sorted out protect as best we can now. What do we do next with the grow piece? I think that's, if there's MPI in the room, I don't think I'm being unfaithful to you. I think that's what they're getting their heads around next. How do we proactively help our primary industries grow, but at the same time protect? So government are absolutely critical, but where I see the rubber hit the road most is with local government. Um, so central government is setting good, you know, those sort of policies about food safety and, and etc. But it's with local government that there's a lot of work to be done. Even just our soil types, you know, we shouldn't be using class one and class two soils to grow houses, for example. Um, sorry if you're a lifestyler and you've got a beautiful home. Well done. But I think, um, yeah, I realise it's a retirement package for farming etc. But it's tough when you realise there's so much opportunity out there. So it, it's an enabler. Government, both central and local, are, are huge enablers. Or well, they've gone over time. Oh, what? Last question, Mike. In the UK, the supermarkets control that interface with the consumer. In the yeah. emerging markets, have the supermarkets got the same power or, the, uh, or has distribution Channels, is, this, is that power moving towards distribution channels? Or, so two questions there. Has the supermarkets, are they controlling that space in the emerging markets? The I actually don't know for sure. Um, you know, we've got here, we've got hegemony with the two supermarkets, so you know, obviously, there's full control here. Um, I think it must vary from country to country. You talked about emerging markets. Um, Interesting in Thailand, you've got the CP group, which are 40 billion turnover. They own the entire value chain. They even own the chicken farms. And they own the 7-Eleven franchise in Thailand. So they go right through to what the consumer wants, and so they only produce stuff the consumer wants. And even from their waste, all of that goes into Gucci handbags and all sorts of things, right? So they've worked out the entire model. So I think in emerging countries, there's probably more, a more interesting model than we've got here is what I'd say. I don't know at this stage, just anecdotally. I can hear the masses hoarding outside the door, so we better tie, wrap it up there. But thank you very, very much, Mark. And that is fascinating and a great show. I appreciate it.